We're in the epistle of 1 John, 1 John, chapter 5, and verses 16 and 17. The reason I'm dealing with this is because Jack asked um, in a study last week, or last Monday actually, uh, what do these verses mean? And when you read them, you'll see why he was asking that question. He says, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. So as you can see, a pretty straightforward statement, which is very difficult to understand. And we need some help here to try and work out how to answer that question. The first thing we need to do is we need to glean from the book of First John all the information on this subject that, we, that he has given us. And uh, in order to do that, we're going to have to go to chapter 1, then chapter 3, and then we'll come back to chapter 5 and we'll put all the information together and let it explain itself rather than trying to impose some explanation on it. So in the first uh, chapter of the epistle of uh, First John <coughs> he says in verse 5 after discussing how the eternal life uh, was manifested here on this earth in Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the life of God being manifested in Christ and his life uh, and uh, proclaiming that Jesus truly was the word who had been with God, who was God and who became flesh. He says, I write these things so that our joy may be made complete. There was a tremendous amount of pressure on that teaching now because the Gnostics were putting that pressure on to say impossible. God cannot live in the flesh because God can't have anything to do with the flesh. It was partly because of what was going on in the Greek world. The Greeks never believed that the flesh was of any value or any good. It was just the spirit that was uh, made in the image of God and the spirit was free when it was freed from the body and uh, that was the state that uh, they felt uh, everything should be in. But Christianity doesn't teach that. It teaches that Jesus was here in the flesh, that Jesus died on the cross, Jesus was raised from the dead in the flesh and that Jesus ascended into heaven and that flesh was course was transformed because flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven so that he might live in the heavenly realms with that new uh, spiritual body just as we will one day. But uh, the, pr <clears throat> the problem was even deeper than that. The problem was to do a very personal thing to do with our lives as Christians when we sin. Uh, and the inconsistencies of that and the difficulties that are involved in that and how, how, how are we going to accept the realities and at the same time understand that uh, God forgives us and that there is a way out for us. Uh, how are we going to understand that we are not uh, sinners but that we are righteous if I commit sin, am I not a sinner? Well, we'll see. We'll see. Okay, he says in verse 5, This is the message we have heard from him, and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin, he says. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us, he says. 
So for those who are claiming that they weren't beset by sin, that they had no sin, uh, that they were, in that sense, perfect, he's saying to them, that's not the reality. That's not the reality. The reality is that no one can say, I have no sin. Everyone sins. We've sinned before we became Christians. All have sinned and fall short, fallen short of the glory of God. And unfortunately, we sin after we become Christians. All of us sin. We are all imperfect. We are all um, uh, are dependent on God's grace and God's forgiveness and God's mercy and God's life. But he says, when he's talking about forgiveness, the first thing that you need to get into your head is you need to be walking in the light. He's talking about forgiveness while we are walking in the light. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, and keep your marker in 1 John because we'll be just coming back to it all the time. Uh, in John chapter 8 and in verse 12, while Jesus was here and teaching the crowds and his disciples, he said in verse 12, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, if you marry that to what we've just been reading, this is the message we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Jesus claims to be the light. What light? The same light that God is. He was claiming to be God in claiming to be the light. It might be hidden, but the, the implication is there. And surely <clears throat> the Jew would have understood it better than we would understand it. Because they knew that God was light. And we had to walk in God's light in order to be pleasing him. So when we follow Jesus, we do not walk in darkness. We walk in the light. Very, very important. It's when we're following Jesus Christ that we're walking in the light. There are numerous things that will come in to take you away from that. All, all of the things of the world, the, the, the daily chores, the worries, the cares, the riches, the pleasures, all, all of these things tend to crowd in and stop you from following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ our Lord. They tend to take you away from the Word of God. We, we drift very slowly, but nevertheless we drift. And there's times when we're, we, we look back and we realize how far we've drifted. To be walking in that light is to be following in the footsteps of Jesus. But it also means that we are in Christ. And in John chapter 15, where he gives us the example of the vine and the branches, <coughs> He's telling us that while we're walking, it's not like the Jews walking in the law where they felt in and of their own strength and their own wisdom and their own discipline and, and uh, their own determination that they could keep that law. We know from our efforts just to be Christ-like how far short we fall of that standard. And we're well aware of it. So we, we need some help for us to be able to do what God wants us to do in Christ Jesus our Lord in order for us to be like Christ. Like him in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds. <coughs> And it's the thought of this connection to Christ, this real, genuine, spiritual connection to Christ that will help us to understand that that help is there. It surrounds us. It buoys us up. It provides everything that I need to be able to do what God wants me to do, 
no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the temptations. Let's look at this teaching on the vine, on the true vine, I should say, in John chapter 15. I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit he prunes it so it may bear more fruit. To be walking in the light and following in the footsteps of Jesus means that you will bear fruit. We are, we're all in the vine. We've been baptized into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. We're baptized into the body of Christ. We're in Christ. Now, that means we are in the vine. We're branches in that vine. We've got a, a vital connection to the source of our nourishment, to the source of our growth, to the source of our fruit bearing. A vital connection. It's deeply rooted in God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there's the power that comes up, as it were, from God himself through Christ to provide for us the necessary equipment and the necessary temperament and the necessary spirituality to be fruit-bearing Christians in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you stop bearing fruit, and that's what happens when we're on that drift, when we're moving away from Christ, when we're moving away from His Word, we stop bearing the fruit. And you know something, there's a, there, there's a, a price to be paid for that. Whether you know it or not, or maybe it's unbeknownst to you, we get more and more unhappy in ourselves when we are not measuring up to what we know we should be measuring up to. We know after 10, 15, 20, 30 years as Christians that we should be much further on. That we should be much stronger spiritually. That we should be much more knowledgeable of the Word of God. We know that. But instead of doing anything about it, we will just continue to drift and we become more and more unhappy. And that unhappiness spills over and affects the lives of other people as well. It happens. That's the human thing. It happens. I just want to tell you about it so that you can look out for it and not get caught in it or at least not get caught so that you can't get out of it. It's one thing to be in it, it's another thing to get out of it. And he says in verse 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. <coughs> Accept this as the gospel truth. Apart from me you can do nothing. Well, why am I trying to do it all apart from Jesus Christ, my Lord? Why am I not thinking of him when I'm doing what is right? Why am I not thinking of him when I'm studying? Why am I not thinking of him when I'm worshipping? Why is there such a disconnect in my head and in my relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord? He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But we're making such strenuous efforts to do it apart from him. And it's to his dishonor. He wants to be our God. He wants to save us. He wants to provide for us. He wants to protect us. He wants to lift us up. It's me and you that don't want it. We want the glory for ourselves. We want to feel that we are strong in and of ourselves that we're disciplined enough to achieve it, but you're only going along with the customs of the world and the philosophies of our day. You could do anything you want to do. I believe that once. It's a lie. You can't. You're limited by what you've what you find in yourself, you're limited by your circumstances, you're limited by the time you live in, you're li uh, limited by so many things. You can't 
be what you want to be or do what you want to do in and of ourselves we are not going to achieve what God wants us to achieve and rightly so otherwise we'd be going before the throne of grace and we'd be bragging no flesh will boast before God no flesh and for good reason because we've got nothing to boast about but somehow or other we'll twist it and we'll make it something that I'm proud of which means I'm proud of myself it says apart from me you can do nothing if anyone does not abide in me he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned I didn't say that what do you mean you didn't say it? I've just read it. I'm not telling you. Who's telling you then? The word of God's telling you. Jesus. These are the words of Jesus. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. We know what that means. That should always influence us. I need... People need to fear God. Our God is a consuming fire. He can't have anything to do with sin and unrighteousness, with transgressions, with disobedience and high-handed rebellion. He can't reward that. He can't say, that's okay. Don't worry about it. I've covered it for you. God cannot allow the guilty to go unpunished. He can't. That's his nature. That's who he is. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father, by, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Okay, so here we are. We are accepting that while we walk in the light, we are walking in Jesus Christ our Lord. We are as a branch in the vine, accepting the nourishment, accepting the comforts, accepting the promises, taking God at his word, living by faith in the Son of God, allowing the Son of God to give us the ability to achieve what God is asking us to achieve. He says, uh, if we say that we have fellowship with him, this is now back in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. It's just an impossibility for us to walk in darkness and be acceptable to God. We are not a part of Christ if we live in the darkness. We don't have fellowship with Christ if we live in the darkness. We don't, we have lost our eternal life if we walk in the darkness. Remember those who hated the light? Why did they hate the light? Because they loved the darkness. You've got to not love the darkness. Somehow or other, all of us have got to rise to the notion that those who follow Christ must, as he did, hate evil. Hate evil. That doesn't mean hating people. It means hating the evil that people do because we know who's back of it and we know that it's his attempt to destroy everything that's good and to destroy the Son of God if it were possible so he says if we say 
or sorry, uh, uh, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We were redeemed by the blood of God, or by the blood of Christ. Revelation 1 verse 5, redeemed by it, bought out of bondage, the price was paid for us to be free of our sin and to live to righteousness. We've been cleansed from those sins. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. We have been forgiven of those sins. We need to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins we have done it we're forgiven of those sins and what cleansed us from the sin the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that's what cleansed us not the water not the water the blood of Jesus Christ that blood which was offered to God for purification for sins and was accepted by God for pur purification from sins. Christ has done that for us. So while we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse us from sin. It's there to do just that. It is totally available for all of us. Any of us who continue in wrongdoing and don't look for forgiveness are going to miss out on the opportunity of having, of being sprinkled clean by the blood of Jesus Christ from our transgressions. Of returning to being counted righteous by God because of our faith. We're going to miss that opportunity. And that's the point he's making here. He says, how will we get forgiveness when we do commit sin? If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This, this has always been the case. Now we know under the Old Testament that God forgave sins in view of what Jesus was going to do. We know that. But we're living under the new covenant. And when Jesus, and we're going to remember it when he gave the cup, he says, this is my blood of the new covenant. That blood that cleanses us from all of our wrongdoing, all of our transgressions, all of the condemnation that will come because of those transgressions, it's all lifted off our shoulders and God gives us the freedom to get on with doing what we know to be right. But we have to be willing to confess. Um, Proverbs chapter 28. He says in verse 13, He who conceals his transgression will not prosper. He who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. How blessed is the man who fears always, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Our, our way of escape is not to conceal what's going on. Remember David concealed his transgression with Bathsheba. Thought he could hide it. Hide it from everybody else. But he couldn't hide it from God. He did hide it from others for a long time. He thought he could even hide it from himself, but his conscience got the better of him. It nearly drove him mad. And rightly so too. But there's so many sins that we don't want to acknowledge our sins. So much unrighteousness in our lives that we don't want to acknowledge as unrighteous and therefore sinful. There's so many times when we know to do right, but we don't do it. And we forget that that also is sin for us. The standard is very high. 
very, very high. So we need to be willing not to conceal our transgressions. And the prosperity comes through confessing and forsaking them because we will be shown compassion by God and we will be given forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. In Psalm 32, here's David looking back on the time he was concealing his sin and in the opening verses lauding the fact that God could forgive and does forgive. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fervent heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin, he says. That was the wonderful thing that he experienced. God immediately, <coughs> lovingly, and without hesitation, gave him the forgiveness of his sins. Do you think he's not going to do the same thing for you? Of course he is. That's what Christ has bought for us. This ability for God to forgive us of our sins. But you have to be willing to confess them. And that's the point I want to make here. Okay. Hopefully we've, we've, we've got that. Um, and if we have that, then we can move on to 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, we read verses like verse 6, and they become as confusing as 1 John 5, verses 16 and 17. It says, no one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Now, you'd, you'd, have, to, you'd have to say, out of, my, out of your experience, out of my experience, that wouldn't be true. I'm trying to be a Christian. doesn't mean I don't sin. I do sin. God forgive me. I do sin. But what's he saying here? Is he saying that, uh, that you, you can't sin or that you won't sin? Because if that's true, then no one who sins has seen him or knows him. Which means my relationship with God is such that I don't really know him and he doesn't know me. And I haven't really seen him. And he does not want to see me. So now that would be disastrous. But you see, the explanation is in its context. You can lift a scripture out of its context. We, we all know this. You can lift it out and you can make of it what you like. But it has its context. Verse 4 right down to verse 9. He says, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness is just a transgression of God's law. So when we practice sin, we're living in lawlessness. We're breaking God's law. We're doing what God tells us not to do. We're doing it high-handedly. We're doing it hard-heartedly. We're doing it in opposition to all that is good and all that is right. We're doing it against our new nature, which is Christ in me, the hope of glory. We're doing it in, in, in spite of all those things. We are practicing sin. Now, I want us to see from what I've got up on the board, what happens here, practicing sin. That just means living in sin. 
It means walking in sin. It means habitually sinning. It means unrepentant sins. It means that we've developed a bad character again, probably gone back to the old self and all the nastiness of it and all the all the uh, all of what you hated about yourself. That's what starts to come out here. So it's not just one sin. This is living in it. Not repenting of it, living in it, loving it, wanting it, doing it. Regardless of what God's word says, regardless of the warnings that other brethren might give us, regardless of, uh, of the consequences, which I should know about from the scriptures anyway. Regardless, I'm going to do this. I am determined to do this. I don't care what anybody says. I am just, this is what I want to do. And I feel this is right for me. See, what, what it is, you see, it's the self. I can't get it across strongly enough that our self, our selfishness, our self-indulgence, our self-obsession is the problem. That's what is the problem. Everything is about me. You're like the person who goes into the hospital to visit somebody else who's just after a big operation, sits down to the side of the bed and says, how are you feeling? Not so good. I know how you feel. I remember the time I went into the hospital and for the whole hour of the visitation they talked about nothing but themselves. Wonderful stuff. Happens all the time. I don't know if you're guilty of it yourself. I think most of us to some degree are guilty of it. But that's, that's the sort of selfishness. Oh, I know I should be walking in the light. But I've got all the reasons in the world why I'm walking in the darkness, why this has happened to me, why I've been so discouraged, why this, that, and the other happened, and, and all of the excuses to, to slip back into the sin and the sinful ways and to do the things we know God forbids us to do. So that's what this lawlessness is and practicing sin. And we've got, to, we've got to see that in it, this is the context now. When he says in verse 6, no one who abides in him sins, he's, he's foreshortening it. He's saying no one who practices sin or lives in sin or walks in sin or habitually sins or unrepentantly sins or develops a bad character once more, sinful fleshly character which was probably yours before you became a Christian and is now yours again but doesn't care about it he says no one who abides in him can do that no one who sins has seen him or knows him so all of the encouragement that went from the Gnostics to just indulge the flesh. Don't worry about it. Everything's all right. It's not what you do. It's God's forgiveness that counts. Uh, and you can do all the horrible things that people love to do. And you'll be all right. He says, no, you're not going to be all right. It is inconsistent with who we are, with who Christ is, with who we are in Christ. It's inconsistent with all of that. Little children, he says... Verse 7, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for the purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Again, verse 9 has got to be... Uh, read in that sense he cannot sin not in the sense that he can't commit a sin which we saw mistakenly uh, or uh, unknowingly sinning 
as you try to walk in the light. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a deliberate way of life now, a continuation in wrongdoing that is opposed to everything that God wants of us. We are supposed to be righteous. And because we've been counted righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord and our faith, we are supposed to practice righteousness. That's our contribution. That's us saying to God, I want to be righteous. I am so determined to do what you want me to do and to do right by you and by others and even by myself for that matter that I am going to practice what is right and what is good. This lifestyle is only from the devil. It's not from God. The righteous lifestyle is from God in Christ. We can slip into this so easily. So easily. But we must see it for what it is and we must determine to confess to God. To God, because he's the one you have to do with. Do it now before you face him in the judgment. Because if you don't, you're going to face your sins and he will not show partiality. Just as he has condemned the unrighteous who never knew God, so he will condemn the righteous who knew God but lived in unrighteousness. All right, now we can go to 1 John chapter 5. I think we've got enough information. He says, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. What does that mean? Well, uh, there's there's interesting um, thing from Old Testament which illustrates this. Um, if you touched any of the holy things that belong to the tabernacle, if you deliberately looked on those holy things and you weren't a priest, you would be put to death. Numbers chapter 18, verse 22. He says in verse 22, The sons of Israel shall not come near the tent of meeting again, or they will bear sin and die, he says. So here's the sin leading to death. There are other sins as are related in Exodus chapter 22. And I'm just, I mean, there's so many um, things we could have compared, but I'm just giving a short, brief sketch of what leads to sin or what could lead to sin and what doesn't lead to, uh, or to death, I should say, and what doesn't lead to death. Um, in verse 1 of Exodus chapter 22, it says, If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, now remember these were, these were country folk, these were farmers, um, most of the people got their living from the land, the big cities as we have them in, pre in present day wasn't, uh, it just wasn't there at that time. Uh, the majority of the people were living on the land and from the land. He says uh, that's why a man stealing an ox was, or a sheep and slaughters it and sells it. He shall pay five oxen for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. Jump down now to verse 5. If a man lets a field or a vineyard be grazed bare and lets his animal loose so that it grazes in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. If a fire breaks out and spreads to thorn bushes so that stacked grain or the standing grain or the field itself is consumed, he who started the fire shall surely make restitution. 
Verse 9, for every breach of trust, whether it is for ox, for donkey, for sheep, for clothing, or for any lost thing about which one says this is it, the case of both parties shall come before the judges. He whom the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor, he says. He shall pay double to his neighbor, but he wasn't to be killed. So there are certain sins where restitution was acceptable form of repentance, where other sins just had the death penalty attached to them. And in a way, that's true also in the New Testament. What, what we have is, um, we, we know from uh, Romans chapter 6.23, the wages of sin is death. So all sin in under the New Covenant, because we're dealing with spiritual death, tends to spiritual death, separation from God. That's the tendency, that's where it's leading to. Now we know from chapter 1 that there was, or it was possible to accidentally sin while you were walking in the light. We know that it was possible to mistakenly sin while you were walking in the light. We know that through momentary, a momentary lapse or temptation or excitement we could sin. We know out of ignorance or through ignorance we can sin. We know that we can sin unbeknowingly to ourselves we sin. And then, of course, there is the deliberate sin. There is the deliberate sin. But in this case, in the, in, in the case of deliberate sin, which is more serious than all of the others, God gives a period, uh, for the most part, not always, but for the most part, he gives a period wherein he waits for your repentance. We know this from uh, the book of Revelation. I think it's Revelation chapter 3. Uh, let's see. Pardon me. Yeah, it's uh, the church of Thyatira, chapter 2 now, sorry. I said chapter 3, chapter 2. He says in verse 19, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Watch this verse 21. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. I gave her time. Now you see when you sin and the heavens don't fall down on your head and there's no immediate um, punishment for it and especially if nobody else knows about it you think oh, thank God I got away with it. Just imagine we thank God for getting away with it. That's how foolish we are. We haven't got away with it. And don't thank God. He's giving you a period of grace. That's all. He wants you during that period not to compound your sins. It's like somebody who's out on probation. The, the goodness of the court allowing them probation is not a license, as so many of them think, to get on with doing stealing and, uh, and murdering and, uh, uh, and whatever else they're doing wrong uh, to be done when they've got the freedom to do it. It was never intended for that reason. No more than God giving you the time to repent is a license for you to sin again and to sin worse or to continue in the sin that you need to be repenting of. So you see, if you find a brother, if you see a brother or sister in this category, 
you can pray for them. Pray for them that their eyes will be opened. Pray for them that God will grant them repentance that leads to life. Pray for them that they will see the light before it is too late and turn to God and find forgiveness and restoration. And God is willing to answer that prayer. Your prayer on their behalf. And sometimes, quite often, when, when we're in this, we don't see it as clearly as other people do. And their prayers might be a tremendous boom before God on your behalf. And if people have been praying for us, and we know we need to thank them, or thank God that there are people always who are praying for us. Always. Even if you're not praying for them. So, so that's what this is about. A sin not leading to death. But the sin that leads to death is the sin that is, she was not willing to repent. She wanted to continue in, in her, Jezebel wanted to continue in her immorality. She wanted to practice sin, live in sin, walk in sin, habitually sin, be the bad character that she was. And yet she was obviously professing to be a Christian and even professing to be a prophetess. 